The message tonight is one that I, I, you know, I initially, when I began to write my message last week, I was just sitting Sunday during the day, and I, I just got stuck, and I couldn't get, I couldn't get the message out, and uh, so I was like, Lord, are you trying to switch this message up on me? Because I'm just, I'm not getting nothing. I'm not, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at my Bible, I'm reading, I'm praying, and nothing's coming to me. So on Monday, it hit me, and uh, I don't know for whatever reason, this is what the Lord has put on my heart. The message tonight, or this afternoon, is the kingdom of God is at hand. Now we've heard that phrase many times and we've read it over and over and over again in the New Testament. And uh, I derive this message out of Mark chapter 1 verse 15 if you want to turn there. And the word reads and saying the time is fulfilled the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now that seems and it sounds pretty simple. John the Baptist had a very powerful message uh, being the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He preached a message that was so strong that even the Pharisees and Sadducees had to come see what was going on. This man was, if God said of this man there was not another prophet like him, that he was the greatest prophet of all. The power of God was on his life and his ministry to such a degree. Again, I reiterate that the Pharisees and Sadducees had to come check this guy out. And he said, you brood of vipers, who has warned you? Who has told you? And uh, the fact is, you know, people want to find out what's going on with when, when, when they hear something. Well, who is this guy? Let me go check him out. And while their intentions might have not been right, God had a purpose and a plan. There's not been a time in history that this statement has been so true. Going back to the very beginning of time, the kingdom of God has been at hand. Now, how many people here tonight know we live, we're, we're living in perilous times? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 and 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. We see that today so much with the young people. Young people are so disconnected that they're unthankful. They're, you know, video games, whatever it may be that's taken hold of them. Satan has took hold of our children. And he's taking hold of our children. Their disobedience to, to, to their parents. They're unthankful. They don't have that natural affection anymore because they have replaced it with video games and everything else. I'm not saying every video game's bad, but the vast majority of them are. People are truth bakers today. That's just the bottom line. False accusers, uh, despisers of those who that are good. You know, look at the media today. They despise those people that actually try to do something good. They talk bad about them. They call in those things which are good, evil, and which are evil, good. This generation has flip-flopped to such a degree that without a strong presence 
of the Holy Spirit to turn this nation and this world around, God forbid, to see what else happens in our society. They heed him, they high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The Bible says, turn away from such. You know, it's easy to say all the right things. It's another thing to carry them out. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you to actually carry out what God has ordained me or you to do. Within our own strength and our own self, we're only limited to what we can do. The kingdom of God is more vulnerable today than it's ever been in its whole history. People say today that the world's getting better and better. But if you take a true look at the world, the world is getting worse and worse. That's right. There's nothing good that's actually on a corporate scale that it's getting better and better and better. It's getting worse and worse. And that's what the Bible says. People have taken the Bible and put it on its shelf and they're looking at every other fad. And believe in that over the Bible. You know, there's nothing new underneath the sun in Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, it says. And again, like I just reiterated, the kingdom of God has been at hand since the creation of man. It's so easy to say the right things, but to do the right thing is another. We can dress up our walk and our talk with the fig leaves that, are, that we saw the, together. But they will eventually fade away. God wants to dress us in his righteousness. We were created in God's image and clothed with his righteousness. You know, I was talking to somebody just the other day and I, I, I was saying, you know, when God created man, he created him. He, he didn't just speak him into existence. He actually took his hands informed man. That means that he took his time. Man is intricate, woven. He blew in the breath of life and he became a living soul. In Psalms chapter 8, it says that the angels go, man, why is God so mindful of them? And then the author writes, he created him a little lower than Elohim, God himself. He created us, me and you, just a little bit lower than himself. He crowned us with glory. You know, we're going to get to that point one day in life. And we're going to and when we when we hit heaven, we're going to say we're going to see our full potential. I'm not saying you can't live to your full potential right now as we speak, but we still live in a fallen state. We live in a sin-filled world. But God saves us. Not, he saves us out of sin. Not in sin. We don't have the right just to keep on sinning. Just because we're saved, he saves us out of that and puts us, our feet on solid ground. Um, we're special to God. We're not just an uh, animal. We're not just a, a, you know, a part of the animal kingdom. Adam had the ability to name. He was so intelligent. He named every single animal. He named every single species that is underneath this sun. Think about it. Highly intelligent. But yet, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy God's creation. And the kingdom of God was at hand when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and took the fruit. Surely you should be like God, knowing both good and evil. It was the lust of the eyes. It was the pride of life. It was everything all consumed in one that he presented to them. Why? To destroy God's plan. To destroy God's creation. You see, the kingdom of 
God wasn't just at hand when John the Baptist announced it. It's been at hand. It's been at hand in the days of Noah. When God was looking for a righteous man to stand up and preach his gospel. I ask you tonight, who will stand up and preach God's gospel? You see, the kingdom of God was at hand when God called Abraham out of the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. You see, he could have took, he could have disobeyed that voice and went in a different direction. Who then would be the father of faith? The kingdom of God was at hand when Abraham went to sacrifice his son. When God says, take your son, your only son, and bring him up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. You see, the, the, the kingdom of God has been at hand for thousands of years. And it's at hand more than what you even think tonight. We got child massacres. We have terrorist attacks happening on a daily basis. But you know what's greater than all these tragedies? Men and women, boys and girls, dying without God. That's the real tragedy. Amen. That's the real tragedy. And you know what? We're the watchmen. We're the watchmen on the wall. It's time, I'm telling you, it is time for men and women to put on their big boy shoes and boots, strap them up, lace them up, and get ready. There's a real war going on, whether you want to admit it or not. Of course, we, we battle with one, against, and it's not against flesh and blood. It's about principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. But there's another war that's going on that's in the unseen world. And they're after men and women boys and girls, believers, non-believers, it doesn't matter. Nobody's excluded. Everybody is included. And Satan wants them all. He wants them all. And his tactics are out there. People are dying and falling away by the wayside. We see it every single day. I'm guilty of not doing for lacing up. For putting my boots on. God has called us to be soldiers. We in the army. No matter where you want. This ain't a militant speech. But this is the truth of the gospel. He commissioned all of us. He didn't say some. He didn't say a few. He said all. Go ye into the world. And preach this gospel of the kingdom. Nobody's excluded from this command. Nobody. And I fought myself first. We should have people in this church tonight. Hearing the gospel. There's many people that are dying. And hurting. And the truth is. Maybe a lot of people won't say this. But I will. They're going to hell. That's, right. That's the bottom line. Heaven and hell. As real as me and you are real. God's word is real. He says he watches over his word more than his name's sake. And he looks over his name. And But he said he watches over his word more than his name's sake. Everything that has been fulfilled in the Bible has come to pass. Why wouldn't people believe how much more you should not, you should believe. But it says, repent ye and believe the gospel. It's the good news. Jesus Christ has came and paid away for you and I. And everybody here knows this, the message. I don't have to reiterate it. But what I'm here to do tonight is to encourage you. To encourage you to move forward 
into evangelism. I'm here tonight to tell you that there are people that we know that are going to hell. And you know, it could be just a simple, a simple little voice, a simple little word that you tell them in the nick of time and they accept it. You may have told them a thousand times. You may have never told them one time. But the burden does lie upon us. <laughs> you see, God is preparing a people for Himself who will praise Him, who will worship Him, no matter what the circumstance might be. We are tested and tempted to the measure of faith God has given us. No one can say, God has put too much on me and I can't take it. Though we may feel like that at certain times, God will never put too much on us. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the word reads, There hath no temptation taken, but such that is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. But with that temptation also, He'll make an escape that you may, you'll be able to bear. You know, the, the kingdom of God was at hand when Moses' mother and sister put a little baby boy in the basket and floated him down the Nile. You know, who would have gave the law? Yeah, God, of course, he could have right, rose up another person. You know, he said he can make the rocks cry out, but that's not his plan. His plan wasn't for another Moses. His plan wasn't for another Abraham. His plan wasn't for another David. His plan wasn't for another Robert or Scotty or Michelle or any of you. His plan was for you to do what he's called you to do. What he's called me to do. He's not looking for another. He's looking for you. He said he can make the rocks cry out and praise him. He don't need us, but he's looking for you. God's plan for our life is bigger than our circumstance. It's bigger than our dilemma. It's bigger than our job, bigger than our friends. It's bigger than our social standing. We serve a big God. He can do big things. He spoke this universe into existence. Whatever you're going through, He can do it. Why is it so important to know that the kingdom of God is at hand? This is not just some slogan or phrase made up by preachers, evangelists, teachers to get the people moving in some direction. It's the heartbeat of God because His people are involved. Like I said, heaven and hell are real. People's lives are at, at stake. Again, we see so much tragedy in the world. Officers being shot. Um, those, those shootings just hurts my heart to know that those children didn't have a chance. We live in a crucial time. Like I said, where evil is being spoken of good and good is evil. How can we tell that we're here at the end? You know, we, you, we may have been hearing this or preachers may have been saying that for the last hundred years. We're near the end. We're near the end. We live in Matthew 24. Well, they got some validity, validity to it. One of the scriptures that come to my mind is Matthew, often quoted scripture, scripture Matthew chapter 24, where it says there will be rumors of wars, famines will be in the land, catastrophes. We're seeing a lot of that right now with wildfires, volcanoes, earthquakes. Um... But another thing, how we gauge all this is we gauge it off the Bible, not just um, because of these catastrophes that's happening, these acts of God. We look at Israel being God's prophetic timeline. 
there are certain events that take place in, in Bible prophecy that uh, has already happened up until this point. This ain't something that's just uh, made up or put together by a number of preachers. This is what the Bible says. Israel is God's prophetic timeline. Um, we see in 1948 that Israel became a state, became a country. God gathered these people from all the other nations together to bring them back to the homeland. The Bible speaks of that, bringing the people of Israel back to their home, their native land. We see that in the book of Daniel it says that knowledge will increase in the last days. We've seen in the last 20 years technology increase to such a uh, fast degree that it's mind-blowing. Not only knowledge in technology, but knowledge actually in biblical principles. We see that actually have been flourishing, people understanding the scriptures. You know, back just 200 years ago, they didn't have many Bibles. The layman was cheated, if you will, to when it came to understanding the scriptures. They were withheld that information for centuries, to be frank with you. Now, we have such a great vast of knowledge of the scriptures. Today, any one of us would be a scholar to the days of, of people 200 years ago. So we see these things happening right before our eyes. But you know what? Satan keeps us so busy, he tries to, where we just push all that back on the back burner. You know, we often hear about putting the armor of God on. And most believers like to hear about putting the armor, the armor of God on because... It describes a Roman centurion dressed to the fullest. You know, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the gospel shoes, you know, the boots. All those uh, that weaponry, you know, it makes somebody feel good. Some people say they wake up with it. They have it on continually, and you should. But if you're dressed as a soldier, and you just or sitting or lying in your bed, what good are we doing for the people that's on the front lines? There's people, again, there's people dying in that world because there's a real war going on. There is a real war. That's right. And if we say we got the armor of God, um, then we need to walk in that battle. We need to get head first in it. The blood's going to be on our hands. The kingdom of God was at hand when David slew Goliath. What we need today is some giant slayers. You know, he was a little... Little boy, basically. With a just a little slingshot, but you know what he had? He had the armor of God on. Because the Spirit of God came upon him. He slung that rock and it hit that giant. And that giant dropped. You know, God needs someone who's not afraid to take a stand for the gospel. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm ready to get on board with what God's doing. I'm ready to get in, in that battlefield. You know, the devil has stolen so much from us. In some cases, he stole families. In some cases, he stole relationships. In some cases, he stole kids. Some cases he stole jobs. In some cases he stole family members that were very close to us. <coughs> In so many ways, he took something from us. And if we're going to just sit around like a bump on the log, he's just going to keep taking. It's easy. It's easy for him. 
you know why? It's like take it, if we just sitting there with our hands crossed in full fatigues, ready for battle, but we're not doing nothing. He's going to keep taking. You know, my heart goes out to the people that are in bondage, drugs and alcohol. I got a special place in my heart for those people. People that are in prison or has been to prison. To help them. To give them what someone gave to me. I know this was a short message tonight. I don't want to take too much of your time. And here, just a few minutes, I'm going to close this out with prayer. And I want everybody to be in agreement that we're going to. And I'm not saying everybody's not, but even if you are, you can do more. Everybody can do more. saying this is for everybody in here, but everybody can do a little more than what they're doing. God has called us all to evangelize. The, Timothy says, do the work of the evangelist. He was speaking to believers. He wasn't speaking to preachers. He wasn't speaking to pastors. He was speaking to believers. Do the work of the evangelist.